Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. So we're now going to start talking about the real deal, real chromatography and getting out of the world of theory. And we're going to start by talking about gas chromatography. So what I want to do in this mini lecture is just kind of introduce you very broadly to GC, as I'll call it, how it works, what the components are of the instrument in particular. So it'll be a pretty quick lecture, but do me a favor and try to block diagram it at the end before I show you the answer. So, so a really important question is when do you use gas chromatography? What is it really useful for? And as I said last week, chromatography is generally about the analysis of organic molecules. I mean, you'll find it used to polymers, you'll find cases where it's used for metals, but really fundamentally it's the workhorse for looking at organic molecules in mixtures in particular. So materials that are really good for gas chromatography kind of have two features. The most important of which is they have to be volatile. And what the term volatile basically means is they have appreciable vapor pressures at room temperature, such that when you heat the system up, they can be completely volatilized. So because gas chromatography works with a mobile phase, that's a gas. You have to be able to get your analytes into the gas phase in their whole entity. They can't thermally decompose. And generally speaking, volatility scales with molecular weight. So really big things like polymers or peptides just don't have any don't have any appreciable vapor pressure, and so they're really, really hard to do gas chromatography on. The other thing you're going to find is that GC is going to work better with systems that are more nonpolar. That's a little bit less of a, of a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, if you have things that are like alkanes, a little factoid for you to know, of all the chromatography done right now, roughly 25% of it is GC. If you can make it GC, you do, because in general it's thought to be an easier technique and certainly historically was more broadly applied before liquid chromatography. So what's the magic box of gas chromatography look like? Well, you are going to in fact inject a sample, but this time you're not going to be getting the concentration of metal out. You're going to be actually measuring a chromatogram. And from the times that are present in the chromatogram, you're going to know what you have. And if you integrate the peak, you may know how much is there. And if you have a mass spectrometer as a detection system, you're going to really be able to ID your peaks directly. Well, a typical gas chromatograph is a fairly large tabletop system, a uh, pretty big. Um, it's not a, it's not like a little shoebox. It's going to take up a good size, good fraction of a desk. The one shown here has the all important auto sampler. Uh, it's pretty standard. A lot of the space is taken up with the oven and the column, as you'll see in a second. And over on the left, you can see a guy actually injecting a sample in. So it's kind of funny when you use a GC, <laughs> since it's kind of a big instrument, and you end up injecting like 10 microliters of material into it. Um, but in any case, it's a, it's a workhorse. You'll find them in a lot of labs. So what does that system have to do? What are the different components of a GC? Well, the first thing that the instrument has to provide is a means for getting the sample introduced into the mobile phase. GCs usually work by continually flowing a mobile phase through the column. And so you can imagine, going back to the stream analogy from last week, there's a continual stream running through the system, just carrying helium or nitrogen, something like that. So you need an injection system. And then for GC, that's complicated because that injection system may have to volatilize your analyte, depending on how you load it in there. Then you're going to need a whole bunch of stuff related to the mobile phase. <laughs> You have to have pretty ultra pure, ultra pure gas cylinders sitting there. You're going to have flow regulators and flow meters. You're going to have a bunch of tubing and piping. It's a lot of plumbing that allows those gases to flow through the system continually. So there's a whole bunch of infrastructure associated with gas handling in a, in a gas chromatograph. The sort of guts of the instrument are the column, which sits in an oven because you're doing gas chromatography your um, mobile phase and your analyte and your stationary phase are almost always heated because you want everything to be volatile. And how high you heat it really depends a lot on what you think your mixture is. And then finally, down at the very end, you have to have a detector. You have to know when does your analyte come out. It has to be a detector that can discriminate your analyte against the much, much higher concentration of background gases like helium, nitrogen, and hydrogen, which are the three most common. And it needs to be pretty sensitive, right? Because you have very dilute samples, just a little tiny bit of analyte that went into that gas phase. It has to be rapid response and really pretty sensitive. So this is kind of one block diagram of a GC, so you can sort of see what was inside that box. Uh, you can see a lot of different carrier gases shown here. Um, there's a sample injection port. Here is a picture of the oven, and so this big coil here is actually the column itself. GC columns can be as long as 30 meters. 
then you can of course see that this would be the detector system depending on what you have and then of course you can get your get your signal that way so a couple of things just remember about GC uh, it's really gas liquid chromatography because the support that you have in the column is usually liquid. You may have a solid material to kind of hold it there, but it's like a frosting on top of that. And it may be more of a gel, but it's still considered to be a liquid stationary phase. And also, the mobile phase is inert. It's not supposed to interact with anything. It's just there to push everything through the system. So it's a really important thing in gas chromatography, and it limits the choice of gases as mobile phases because you're often operating at temperature maybe 250 C in some cases maybe even 300 and so your mobile phase needs to be very inert and simply push your stuff through the column it also by the way has to be ultra pure which is one of the big costs associated with operating GC's is you need really high purity gases that you really flow you use a lot of gas in one day with the GC one of the things to keep one of the things to keep in mind then is that we're going to see something very di different in liquid chromatography where by altering the mobile phase we can really change a lot about the separation in gas chromatography you sort of pick your mobile phase based on cost you might try to tweak a little bit of resolution out of it you might need hydrogen depending on your detector but your mobile phase is actually not one of the more important selection factors so i want you to try to block diagram a gas chromatography system just based on what we we're thinking just sketch it out somewhere don't go back just think about it what are the primary components that you remember we need to do a gas chromatograph injection got to handle a bunch of gases got a column the column sits in an oven and then you have a detector so kind of four things so i'm going to show you a new block diagram and it, and I'm going to map it onto what I just said. So block diagrams are kind of interesting because they can take various levels of complexity. So this one's a little bit more complex than the sort of four system example I gave you. In one case, there's a sample injection port. So that pretty much maps onto what I said before. Uh, we have a column and a thermostat that's inside of, a, of an oven, as is the detector, you'll notice, which I didn't specify before. And then you have a whole detection system. It's not just the detector, but it's the computer and the processing that goes with it which is becoming increasingly important, particularly in the analysis of peptides and proteins using chromatography. And then finally, all the stuff associated with managing gases. Regulators to control the flow rates, flow meters to measure the flow precisely. Those are all part of the system. So as you do block diagrams, you should really think about all the different components. And as I go through them one by one in the remaining mini lectures, one of the things I'm looking for is, do you have quantitative information? Okay, fine, you know the column sits in an oven. How long is the column typically? How, what's its diameter? What are typical temperatures you operate at? Having those quantitative details overlaying your block diagram mean that you have a pretty good sort of mental picture of what the instrument's all about. Thanks so much. See you next time.